Before the law stands a gatekeeper. This video comes from an Austrian lawyer and philosopher. His name was Franz Kafka. And it is known as before the law. Before the law is here to make us all to think about the law. To see exactly what is the relationship between those who seek the law and those who protect the law. I will, for the purpose of this lecture, use the common name banner so as to depict the common man, because the name banner is very common to many tribes in Sierra Leone and it is not gender sensitive. A man can be Pana and a woman can be Pana. And the ordinary man is always constantly seeking the law. It could be seeking what the law is. It could be seeking justice. It could be seeking to know what really makes up the law, wanting to have meaning to it. It could be understanding the law. It could mean life. Either way, even though we go through universities and come out, do we really understand the law? Is it the law what they call biscuit? Have you all of you heard when they say the law is a biscuit? You've never heard it? Why should the law be a biscuit? When in year one you were told that one of the characteristics of the law is predictability. Is that not paradoxical? But that is the beginning of our problem when we come to dealing with it. You see, for 200 years of human existence and more, the law has always been with us. Judgments have been made, rules have been applied. Still, we do not know what the law is. You are here studying the law after five years because you are still seeking meaning of the law. Why even as lawyers do we need judges to tell us what the law is after 200 years, 2,000 years? What really is the law? Is it what is in your books? The laws of Sierra Leone 1960? or what judges say they are. What really is the law? Why do we argue in court over sections of the law that are very clearly passed by parliament? Thou shalt not kill a man, and the dead body is lying down, and we have to argue for months and sometimes years as to whether an offense has been committed. We are seeking the law, not so. And you see, have you ever started playing a game and realized that you do not know all the rules of the game? And what's it? Have you been playing that game and found yourself confused? And the one who is to explain it to you confuses you more? Does it not happen? <laughs> And sometimes the person is even reluctant to explain it to you at all. If you have found yourself in that state, then you are not different from Banana the ordinary man, even though you are a lawyer. Because that is what the law does to us. We study the law for years, we think we are learned, we call ourselves learned, yet, is changing everything. You go before one judge, he explains it this way. You go before another judge, he explains it this way. The high court will rule, the court of appeal says, no, 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 this is fact not correct. It's a game which we never know the full rules. And even as lawyers, we are not different from Bernard the ordinary man. 
who is constantly seeking to know the law. Before the law, in the video you watched, is a parable first published in 1915. It was later featured in one of Kafka's most famous books, The Trial. Both the parable and the novel pose questions about the nature of law and the confusion caused by the law's mysterious set of rules and processes. The trial's main character is suddenly arrested for an unspecified crime. It's like the police pulls you over and uh, he says, I am arresting you. You say, why am I? Are you arresting me? He says, let's go to the station. An unspecified crime. At one point, this character is going through trial, trying to defend himself. But he just cannot know what this law is all about. He wants to defend himself. He does not even know where to start. Then he meets a priest. It is the priest who explains the parable to him that you saw in the video. It is part of the greater work, but it is so important to legal philosophy that it has been cut out and used effectively in legal teaching to open the minds of students of politics and law on this. In the segment titled Before the Law, Kafka's recurrent protagonist is talking with the priest. He relates the story about the man that comes to a great door seeking the law. Before it is a gatekeeper who tells him he cannot allow him to enter. The man seeking the law is perplexed but intentional. So he waits and waits and waits to enter the gates. But he could not enter. The gatekeeper always, always awaits and allows the man to continue waiting, but not letting him to pass through the gate. As the man is dying, this ordinary man who I call Pana, as he's dying, he wonders why he was the only person seeking the law. And then the gatekeeper comes to him and says, Now that you are dying, I am going to close this gate because it was meant for only you. Why? What do you think that means? It means it's like playing a game and the goalpost is shifted all the time. Every man has his own gate. So, somebody raises a defense in one case, in the law, before a court, he succeeds. Another man comes and raises the same defense, sometimes similar facts. And we say we are distinguishing, and we distinguish and distinguish and distinguish, and that same defense does not apply to the similar fact. So every man has his gate before. Is the law predictable? You have a right to answer. Is the law predictable? The fact that they are bumbling shows that everybody has an opinion on it, and that is the purpose of this lecture for you. There is no way we cannot apply the experiences of Pana, the ordinary man before the gatekeeper in our lives. Don't we all seek some law at some point in time? Are we not seeking to understand the existence of the law, even when we sit here as students of law school? After getting your LLB, some of you with first class honors degrees? Are we not bad in the struggle to understand the law by one gatekeeper or the other. The man who is the gatekeeper in the video you saw, instead of even explaining to this man better, he decides to put fear in the man. Not so. He says that even if I allow you to go through, 
there are other gatekeepers. They are more fearful than I am. In fact, the last one, even I, I am afraid to look him in the eyes. Not so. Not so. Does it just bring a bell for you? You come to the high court, you meet one judge dressed in red robes, hot hair and weave, collars and weave, sitting down like this, and you are banned from the country. And you are coming to seek justice before him or her. He's already fearful, not so. But then imagine that after you fail there and you appeal, you are meeting five of them in the court of appeal. <laughs> and after you fail in the court of appeal, you are meeting nine of them in the Supreme Court. <laughs> what is the law that we seek? Why is it structured in this way? Why is it not simple? Why is it not easy to access? Why do we have these more complex layers as you go? This is what Banner faces when he's before the law. But like I told you, Banner is no different from all of you. You are going to find yourself in positions and situations with the law after you finish law school that you ask yourself, why am I here? The reason is they are gatekeepers designed to keep the law the way it is. You see, we come to a point in our lives where we seek purpose and order, yet we are obstructed by gatekeepers. We want help while we are declining in being. All of us, every day, right now as I stand here, I'm declining in being because I'm getting older. But I want to remain healthy. We want youth while we grow old. We need love, yet it is ephemeral. Today you think you are in love, tomorrow you wake up suddenly, it's not so much of love. There is no constant or permanent principle or guide to us in life. We seek reason, we seek law, if you will, that will help us. And thus we seek it so as to discover, to discover our path. But as we go, it becomes more and more obscure. Kafka creates an allegorical tale in which we see senselessness of being in the human condition, perpetually seeking the law and not being able to find it. One of the things that the human being has always sought after is law. There's no point where we are not. The entire purpose of government is law. If not, we could have been independent, everybody going about their business. We are banana. And anyone who seeks to teach the law is your alter ego. I am right now your alter ego. Teachers try to teach us what to think and not how to think. So we come to class. And they tell us this is criminal law, actus non facit rios, that's how many sit here. Or do we really question that statement? Have you, throughout your legal studies, questioned it? You accept it as a fact. You jump to the conclusion that this is men's and that is actus rios. And the man is guilty because both of them are present. Have we questioned the formula? So we seek law, but we cannot find it because we are not thinking what it is first before knowing it. 
Therefore, none of the explanations we receive will suffice, no matter how you are taught the law, to be insufficient. You will be reading and reading and reading until you die. <coughs> book after book. Sometimes on the same issue, negligence. What if I tell you that everything that you have read is a lie? <laughs> Would you abandon this cause and leave? <laughs> no, certainly you will not. You will stay. And you will say, in fact, I want to hear more lies. <laughs> However, if you are told that you failed, you will either drop out of the course or abandon it. That is because the gatekeeper determines who you are. You write an exam, he tells you what is correct and what is wrong. Do you have a means of questioning that? What if the gatekeeper himself was like to? What if his understanding of the law is in fact wrong and yours is correct? But well, you will never have the opportunity to capture it. You are no different from Pana, the ordinary man. You see, this profession which you have chosen has many gatekeepers. Many. And their purpose is to make it difficult every time. Their purpose is to make it not easy. And we convince ourselves that it is rightly so. Because it is what it is. It is design. Design always has a purpose. There is a reason why your nose is above your mouth. There is a reason why your eyes are placed where they are by God. Design always has a purpose. It is for you to find out that purpose. Then you are more fulfilled. But most times, we don't even think about that purpose. We take our nose for where it is and that's it. Why could it be on our mouth? It's the same thing with the law. Panas sits there for years and never gets in. Yes. He came as a very young and very bright old man. Not so you saw in the video, not so? Yes. Yes, he sat. Never got in. He is often indifferently asked questions by the gatekeeper just to desperately find means to gain access. The gatekeeper asks you, where are you coming from? Your people are they nice? What kind of food do you eat? The gatekeeper accepts everything, but always with different remarks. I am only taking it to keep you from thinking you have omitted something. That is what judges do when they are right. Because the gatekeeper, the ordinary man gets frustrated. And he's desperate to seek the law. He's desperate for justice. So he, he even thinks that there is something he has done wrong, he wants to correct it. He goes in his last possession, finds the gift for the judge. Brings the gift, gives it to the judge, and the judge says, hey, 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 hey. You know, this thing you are giving me, I'm just taking it because I don't want you to feel like I, I don't like you. <laughs> and most times, even with that, the ordinary man does not have access to the law. And that is what happened to the gatekeeper. And that, you saw Pana wash his foot? It's a symbol. That is a symbolism. And trust me, you'll be surprised. In fact, judges who are in the provinces, sometimes, by the time they leave the provinces, all the goats will disappear. Because the people will bring so many goats for them, there will be no more goats to eat. I am not saying all judges are like that. This lecture is supposed to open your mind. 
So don't go looking at every judge as that. But I'm telling you that these are some of the reasons why Bana cannot access the law. But yet, look at the symbolism. The gate is always open, not so. Is there any court where people are prevented from coming to file cases? Is there, I remember when I was in practice in 2012, the Chief Justice closed the front gate of the, of the, of the law court building. And I was one of those who went on radio and everywhere on television to say it is symbolic. Because by then, that building was only accessed through the back door. For over five years, not so sad. The Chief Justice closed the front gate of the Temple of Justice. So to access it, you have to pass by the cutting tree, go into one state house, you pass through the back door and you enter. And I remember telling her it was Justice Uwe Hawati Janjalo there that this is symbolic. That means Pana was not even hidden anymore. <laughs> you have to access justice through the back door. <laughs> even though we, 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 we complained the bad association wrote letters, that door never opened until she was. The gate was actually locked. So, when now frail and Pana is dying, the gatekeeper tells him no one else could go through the particular door because it was made for him. That which was supposed to be open was a facade. The other man sacrificed everything but could not get the door. Even watching the judge's feet could not make it the law to the law. Topana, what really does the law represent? What is the law if access to it by the common man is Panayesque? In many countries, government do not allow the common man to access the law. Which in desperation pushes him to break the law by taking it into his own hands. What end does the law serve if the gatekeepers have separate doors and gates for every one who seeks it? Does that not worry you about the law? Is it not worrying that the lawyer does not see black or white? Do you know that lawyers don't see black or white? Do you know what we see? You don't know? We see green. Everything is gray before the other. And the gray, you know that gray is the gradient between black and white, not so. Yes. Depending where the money is, it is darker. <laughs> <laughs> so if the client wants black, the gray is darker in this end. To me. If the client wants white, the gray is whiter. Why? If the law is predictable. What is the purpose of reading the law to become lawyers and judges if the legal system is not available to the normal citizen and they are gatekeepers to ensure it at every stage and level? What can we do about this since we are trained to do justice? The Roman philosopher says that the law is the means. Justice is the end. So, if it is so difficult to access the end because we cannot understand the means, then what are we doing as lawyers? The truth is, the gatekeeper represents the various levels of authority. From the local authority to the highest level, the gatekeeper becomes more less personal and more rigid in observation of the rules and laws established by authorities to patronize the ordinary, the ordinary man, though they are paid to keep it open. So, 
as lawyers, as judges, as various gatekeepers in our spheres, we are not personal. We don't look at the man's circumstances as a human being. We are like robots. You hear it say, the law is the law. You say the law is what is, not, not what ought to be. Is that not what you were told in jurisprudence? Yes. But what ought to be is justice. Do we understand? What ought to be is justice. And justice is the end. It is what we are seeking. So if we cut ourselves off from the personal by saying the law is what is and not what ought to be, we are simply saying justice as we know it does not take your personal circumstances into consideration. Do we understand? Now let me ask you, and I want you to ponder over this again. We are told about judicial independence, not so? And we are taught to believe, as lawyers, that when a case comes before a court, it is an independent judge sitting in his capacity as an independent person to adjudicate the wrong or right between two parties or entities. Not so? And those two parties will be the state. Not so? The state will take your land. The state will use your land to build roads. The state will exploit your property. You could commit crime or you could not commit crime but the state arrests you anyway and prosecutes you. Not so? We are told that all criminal law are at the behest of the state. Because a crime that the person commits, though personal, is against the state. Not so. You come to court and the case is mentioned. The state versus banana. And in that court, it's a state council, like my landed registrar was for several years. <laughs> in that court, it's a judge appointed by the state, paid by the state, giving all kinds of facilities and services by the state. It is that judge who is going to decide your fate against the state. <laughs> Two independent people before an independent judge who determines. But don't you think this is two against one? <laughs> but these things are always before us. We don't really think around it. We accept it as a matter of fact. And we go there seeking justice. We jump all over the place. Lawyers are arguing and going all over the place. Litigants are saying all this that. The state against Pana. Pana is the ordinary man. Pana is being tried by the judge appointed by the state and is being prosecuted by a state council responsible for by the state, representing the history of the state. Everything in that case is two against one. It is not a trial, it is a dire. So what conventional law teaches us has to be challenged. And I'm not doing this because I want you to become rebels. I want you to become reformers. I want you to think. You have been taught a lot of things in the law. And you have not been questioning. I want you, this generation of law students, to start questioning. And that is why at the beginning of this lecture, my uncle who was law officers told you 
that I used to challenge a lot of things when I was at the bar. Because I would look at it not from what I have been taught, but from what it is and seek meaning for it. I could find some applications sometimes. The attorney general will look at it and just put it down. And most of them have never been argued anyway. Because, for example, from 1970 to now, the DPP has been signing what we call non prosecution. And I got up and said, no, the DPP has no such powers. It's the attorney general who should sign. The attorney general does not sign. He has to, in writing, designate a law officer to sign. For some reason, the constitutional provision was read, there is a constitutional provision which says that the DPP can discontinue a proceeding in court. So I said, the power to discontinue is different from Nori Posuke. Nori Posuke has a character in law of its own. It's like a human being of its own. So you can discontinue, you can go to court and say, my lord, I do not wish to proceed in this case anymore. But it does not give you that power to sign. The non prosecution is a very powerful tool. You just sit down in your office, you sign, you give it to a law officer, he goes and gives it to a magistrate, that's the end of the case. I said, no, the DPP does not have that power. Even the constitution does not give it. From the days of Pat Janko to date, this is what we have been doing. I said, okay, this is what you have been doing, but it is wrong, sir. So before they could remember it, there was an application filed in the Supreme Court for a determination of the issue. I could be wrong. But that is what thinking does. I never had an opportunity for it to be hard. And it has not been hard. It is still hard. But what I am trying to do for you, when you become lawyers, is to think about the law. Do not accept things as they are. I told you about Mencia and Atosios. Atus non partis reos visi mensit here. Question it. It may have been said by some drunk English judge 200 years ago. Does that mean today we should accept it? You see, the concept of independence as we know it is questionable. However, students of the law are generally introduced to the ideal type, a prototype of course involving an independent judge applying pre-existing legal norms and after advancing proceedings, a dichotomous decision is given. However, in real life, there are deviations in practice which make this ideal court law adjudicatory process or structure meaningless to the ordinary man. The only acceptable meaning of independence in this sense would mean the judge has not been bribed or was not some other way dependent on the parties. When we say a judge is independent, that's what we usually mean. He has not been interfered with. He has not been bribed. And there are many judges who cannot be bribed. There are many judges who cannot be interfered with. However, are they really independent? Is that what independence means? Tupana, attempting to differentiate the law from other authorities is a facade. Judging and administering are two sides of the same coin. Both judge and the administrator apply general rules to particular situations on the case-by-case -case basis. That's not what we do. We apply general rules to particular situations on the case-by-case -case basis. Both tend to rely heavily on precedent. Is that not what we are told? This precedent. You come and say that's precedent, but is it really a precedent? A precedent that can be distinguished at any time the judge feels. It's not a precedent at all. Both tend to rely on. Both are supplementary lawmakers engaged in filling in the details of more general rules. I'm sure you came across the case Rylands and Fletcher. You also came across the case called Donoghue and Stevenson. We are 
told in the first year of law that judges do not make law. Not so. That is the conventional English teaching that takes us through university and to law school. But will you really read the book of Stevenson and think that no law was made? The neighborhood prison? Is that what the law was at the time? You read Larry Lanz and Fletcher. Very powerful case, not so. You bring something to your land, it tapes and causes damage to another person's land. There was no law. The man had the right to do what he wanted to do on his land. Period. So if I want, I bring gorillas and put them on my land. That was the law. But if there's caves and causes harm to another man, it requires the parliament to make a law. Not so. But if the judges not make law right there and then, I mean, it would be very foolish to think that no law was made. But we accept it. That judges don't make law. And true to the Americans, they have always challenged this. The American reality says this is nonsense. And cases of like this should make us think to review our normal understanding of the law. But now has always been at the mercy of the gatekeeper. He gets justice where state has no interest. Or the adjudicator has no interest. Or the interest of any other person is not weighing on the adjudicator's mind. Or any other consideration whatsoever does not exist. Do we understand this part? How do you get justice before the judicial system? The state should have no interest. The judge should have no interest. And his interest in, includes other people's interests. So if there is somebody who he wants to assist, who has an interest against your interest, he is on that side. There should be no relationship, no kinship, no nothing, no lord, nothing weighing on his mind. Then he can sit down and weigh the case between two people. In a narrow sense, where we lawyers battle all the time is in that last part. When we send cases to court, or litigants come before the court, we pray to God and say, one, the state should not have an interest. So if I have a case against you, what is your name? Franklin. Franklin. If I have a case against Franklin, the state should not be firstly on Franklin's side. If the state is on Franklin's side and the judge represents the state's case, then Franklin should not have another interest that is with him that the judge identifies with. They should not be the same tribe. They should not be the same king. They should not go to the same church. They should not identify themselves with the same way. They should not have attended the same school. You know, you know these boys. See, we are coming from Esikwam Bidari. You see, when people sometimes when you enter a courtroom and the, by the time you start enter, he starts saying, Dayoko! <laughs> Manas make it man! That is a desire to influence the church. It is more powerful than money. So what we pray for is that all these interests should not be there. There is a little sphere where justice can prevail. Where none of this is weighing on the mind of the judge at the time he's adjudicating the case for Panam, either against the state or against his fellow man. You see, there are times when even the state is in danger. You'll be surprised. People think that 
that the state is so powerful that judges don't dare. There are times when judges can even do injustice against the state. That is when that second sphere, the interest part of it, is at stake. Do we understand? Are we following? So in that second sphere, it is the most powerful, the judge's personal interest. There has been a conclusion of elections, and there is an election petition against a winning president. If the judge knows that when that new president comes, I am supposed I will be, or I am at least in line to become chief justice, the state is in trouble. That's all. It could be that it is not even because he wants to be chief justice, but the political party he supports is what will, will, will benefit if he decides one way or the other. The state is in trouble. And we have seen countries where, for example, I saw people celebrating Malawi recently. Malawi recently, they said, oh, the judge is good, that uh, the election should be held, not so. There was another one in Kenya, not so, and all of us have been shouting about it. If you look at it from a critical point of view, critical analytical point of view, you'll find your answer. You see, there are times when Pana is allowed to pass through the gates. Other times, he's not allowed to. To ensure the legitimacy of the process is maintained, Pana is even told that he has a right of appeal. Do you know what a right of appeal does? It creates a psychological situation of legitimacy. So when they rule against you, even if it's unfairly, if you fail to take advantage of the right of appeal, you think that you are the one who are wrong. Even your lawyers tell you, oh, I wanted to file appeal, you said I should not file. But don't forget, the gatekeeper has told the ordinary man, Pana, that the other gatekeepers are more fearful than I am. <coughs> but if you want, I can let you go through and you take your chances with them. The ordinary man is already afraid. If he decides not to take his chances to the tribunal of appeal, it is by no means saying that what was done to him was wrong. All right. But this is what design does. We are therefore faced with all these confusions left. And there are three options available to us. We can obey the law and die sheepishly, like the ordinary man. We can change the law, or the rules, or the gatekeepers. It is within our powers to do so. Or we can rebel against the system that we think is oppressive or wrong. Do you know Foley Sanko was in prison shortly before the labor war started? He was not in trial in court. Do you know? Yes. You have to wear the TRC report. Police Anko was in jail. That is why if you read the TRC report, they will tell you that one of the key causes of the labor war was injustice. The judicial system in Sierra Leone, now it is even better. By then it was structured in such a way that you could not even know where justice is. So people were so fed up that they had to rebel against the system. Talk. We do not want that system. Therefore, I will conclude by saying, as you all go through the law of school, I want you to understand that there are layers of gatekeeping everywhere. This law which you so love, which you want to so join, which you spent your time fantasizing about, which you dream of wearing a wig on your head one day. 
And most of you, if you do a survey here, will say the reason why I am doing this is to do justice. But I want you to understand that the law is not synonymous, synonymous to justice. That justice can be so far away from the law, sometimes you lose, you lose your soul pursuing it. I want you to be a new generation of lawyers who understand this case, who know what we can do as a people to ensure that the ordinary man, most of whom are not as lettered as you are, they do not wear the suits that you wear. They do not speak the English that you speak. They are not educated as you are. Over 60% of this population are exactly in that situation. I want you to understand that the structure of the law as we have it is against them. And that is why in other worlds where the law is today, they prefer arbitration to adjudication. Because there, it is you and I who have to agree our gatekeeper. So if the gatekeeper rules against me, it is my fault. It is not some pre-prepared gatekeeper sitting somewhere to tell us what the law is. But even that has not taken root yet in Sierra Leone that much. But I want you to understand, as you all go through the law school, Think about the law and its gatekeepers, which may include yourselves. Trust me, don't make no mistake. You could be more powerful gatekeepers than the, the powerful gatekeepers than the <laughs> Reflect on the purpose of the law. And then when you successfully go through the law school, come out. Let us walk in the interest of Panama. I do not wish to throw a wet blanket on the law. But I want to open your minds to it. It makes no sense that Bana dies not accessing the law when the gates are open. You should strive to be gatekeepers more in the third sphere if you end up being gatekeepers. Do justice without having interest for anyone or anything. Let us work to restore the prototype independence that we all have. Pana, before an impartial tribunal, administering justice between two adversaries with fair outcomes between them. All this said, the law is imperfect as it is. But it remains the most useful tool for social order and the next best thing. And we all have the duty to protect it while making it accessible to the online man. I thank you.